Okay, so welcome to World History by a Jew. We're now going to be covering Joseph's time in ancient Egypt. And what I'll be doing as the last lecture is we'll be going through a little bit of Egyptian history and then a little bit of Jewish history, and then we're going to see how the two sync up. All right. The, um, uh, let's get this. That. All right. Uh, so this is the outline of my lectures. So thus far, we had two lectures on the Old Kingdom, uh, and then last time we did the Middle Kingdom with Abraham. Now, also, we've already done the last lecture, the Exodus one, because I was trying to time that for Passover, so now we're catching up again. So we're now on lecture four. That means the only one of these that I haven't done yet is lecture five, uh, and we'll, I, I'm, gonna, I'm planning to knock that out too, but it may be a, a couple weeks. Okay. You can now see all the videos on YouTube. So I am doing a lightning fast review. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. If this interests you, then just check out the videos on YouTube. But uh, remember, Egypt was a great civilization for over 3,000 years. It's very hard to cover all this history so quickly. Uh, but I do, for those who are coming on for the first time, I just want to emphasize number six. And that is that the Old Kingdoms, which is the Pyramid Era. We have the Middle Kingdom, which we covered last time, which was there, great literature. And now we're on the New Kingdom, which was the era, uh, the era of temples. And of course, this is when the Jewish aspect of the story really hits. The Old Kingdom, uh, this, was, this was actually how Egypt became Egypt, the, an empire. Uh, so this happened, that's when the first dynasty was, was the Old Kingdom. What you're seeing on your right is the Narmar Palette. Uh, which we talked a lot about, and uh, it got a brief appearance in Lecture 1, but mainly Lecture 2. And we're going to talk about it a little bit tonight, too. It comes into tonight's story. Then we had the Middle Kingdom, uh, and this was what we covered last time, was both the Middle Kingdom and the Hyksos period. This was very relevant to us because this is, without a doubt, when the Semites started coming into Egypt in large numbers. And eventually, the Semites, the, the term is the Hyksos, would take over Egypt. And again, if you want to know more about that, then just see the previous lecture. So last time we ended with the founding of the New Kingdom. So the gentleman you see on the screen is Othmos. He was, he was our final pharaoh we spoke about last time. Uh, I'm going to mention him again tonight because I've got to hand him off to his uh, successors. But what I want to talk about the New Kingdom is, the New Kingdom is really the glory years of ancient Egypt. And with the previous dynasties, I went through and picked out one, maybe two pharaohs from each dynasty dimension. Uh, it's hard to skip pharaohs in the New Kingdom because they are all so interesting. Uh, and I do have to skip a little bit, uh, but I, I like to mention what makes each one of them unique and what, what makes each one of them stand out. And uh, so just to give you a quick preview, that's King Tut. Uh, that's Thutmose, both the first and the third. We have Hatshepsut, and also we have Akhenaten. These are already are some of the most famous pharaohs that the names should be recognizable, even if you really know anything about ancient Egypt. Um, this, the New Kingdom, regardless of how you date it, 95% of people are going to say, 95% of experts, I would say, would say, if Exodus had happened, you know, they always have to have that. If Exodus had happened, it happened during the New Kingdom. Now, you could argue whether it was the 18th dynasty or the 19th dynasty or what decade it may have been in the New Kingdom, but it was the New Kingdom. Uh, and uh, for those of you who skipped ahead and saw the Exodus lecture, you know that the dates work very well for this when you look at the archaeology. Now let's talk about Achmos for a second. Achmos was the, was the son of a full brother and sister. We talked about this last time. Uh, this is, repeats over and over again, and we'll repeat again tonight, about these brothers and sisters getting married. And then he, um, he, he's interesting because he now opens the door for women to have more influence. And in the New Kingdom, women would become their most powerful it specifically in Hatshepsut, but in general, women became more powerful. He used it really as a political tool. I'm not saying he was fighting for women's rights, uh, but what he did is he named his, his sister, who was also his wife, as the God's wife of Amun, which is a high-level priestess. So the political game that he was doing was he was trying to get an in into the highest level of the priesthood. We see this over and over throughout history, right? Because 
even when you look at Jews, the, the Kohanim, the priests, were always separate from the king up until the Maccabean era. It was only under the Maccabees the first time you see this individual who has both positions. And you see it in Europe too. So the, all the history between, say, the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope and the two of them going at it. Uh, this is a common theme. So it was a theme in Egyptian history as well. And Achmos was able to somewhat solve it by naming his uh, wife, sister, as a high official within the priesthood. But this would open the door for royal women becoming more and more powerful, both within the 18th and the 19th dynasty. So Achmos is going to die in his 30s. Uh, he's going to leave a young son. Uh, this is going to be Amenhotep I. But actually, again, to emphasize the thing about women, uh, it's going to be uh, Amenhotep's mother who's going to rule as regent until he reach his majority. With that little Egyptian cliffhanger, let's look at our timeline. So we talked, we looked at this timeline at the very end of our last lecture. Uh, to give you this, this, these dates right here are the rabbinical timeline. You can find them on Chabad.org. You may see some very, very small variations, like a year or two, but pretty much this is, whether you go to Aish or wherever, you're going to see the timeline approximate to this. Uh, now, looking at the timeline of the Semites in Egypt, so last time we were covering this Hyksos dynasty. That's what I mentioned a few minutes ago. Now, we just talked about Achmos. We're about to, to get to Hopchitzit. So this is, um, this is our main area of focus. So we've got Hopchitzit tonight. We're talking about uh, Thutmose III, and we're talking about Amenhotep II. This is all tonight. We're going to move on to Akhenaten in the next lecture. OK, now we're going to review the story of Joseph. For some of you, uh, this story is very well known. Uh, and you don't need a review for others. It's not so second nature. So I'm, if you'll bear with me, for those of you who are more familiar, I want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So I'm going to, as quickly as I can, run through the Joseph story. Uh, now, who was Joseph? So Joseph was the great grandson of Abraham. So Abraham begot Isaac, and then Isaac begot Jacob. Uh, so Jacob was the grandson of Abraham, and then Jacob had a child, actually had multiple children, which we'll get to in one second, uh, but Joseph was his, his star son. Uh, now, Joseph had one full brother, and that's Benjamin, Benjamin. He had a sister, he had, well, half-sister, and he had uh, 10 half-brothers. So these siblings are going to factor in into his very early days and then into his later days. And there's a big middle part of his life where his, his brothers are not, uh, so, uh, aren't such a factor. But let's look at Joseph. He's born in the Haran, uh, which, is, uh, um, which is the land of the Hurrians. And uh, we talk a little bit more about the, about the Abraham uh, lecture. And I talk a lot more about the Hurrians in the Mesopotamian lecture. But um, he moves to the land of Canaan, to Hebron, as a young child, and he is raised as his father's favorite child. So he famously is given the Technicolor dream coat. Didn't actually say Technicolor dream coat in the Torah, but tonight it's the Technicolor dream coat. Uh, and so he gets this, this gift in, from his father that clearly identifies him as the favorite. And instead of being all humble about it, he then brags to his brothers about a couple dreams that he had. Uh, one being, hey, uh, we all are gathering some, some bundles of grain, uh, and lo and behold, my bundle stands up, and all of your bundles bows down to my one bundle. Uh, but that wasn't enough. He then has another dream that he brags to his brothers about, that uh, um, the sun and the moon representing his parents and, and the, the stars representing his brothers are all bowing down to him. Uh, as you can imagine, he's not real popular with his brothers, so they discuss whether to, well, they throw him into a pit, and they discuss whether to kill him, and they end up selling him into slavery. Uh, and we do have a date on this uh, in uh, the rabbinic timeline, which is 1545 BCE. I just want to give you a little bit of a, of a radar for the, the timing we're shooting for. Now, um, so he, this Arab caravan, actually Ishmaelites and the Midianites take him to Egypt, and he's sold to a high official in Pharaoh's court, a minister by the name of Potiphar. 
and now he's a slave under Potiphar and he becomes highly successful, so successful he's running the minister's house. Uh, but due to his intelligence and his good looks and his success, uh, the boss's wife, Potiphar's wife, falls for him and she tries to seduce him. And when he refuses her, uh, her seductions, she then accuses him of trying to rape her and he gets thrown off to prison. Sorry, I'm not doing any commentary. I'm just trying to burn through this for y'all real fast. Okay, so in prison, we have this repetition. He's now in prison and the warden loves the guy and he ends up being kind of the guy in charge, the prisoner in charge of all the other prisoners because he's so successful at what he does. And then lo and behold, these two uh, VIP prisoners come to his attention. Uh, they're both officials from Pharaoh's court, the cupbearer and the cupbearer and the chief baker. And they both had these, these dreams uh, that are driving them crazy. And Joseph hears the dreams. He interprets the dreams, one saying the cupbearer would go free and return to his old job, the other being that the baker would be killed, which is exactly what happens. Cupbearer goes back to Pharaoh's court and forgets about him for two years until Pharaoh has a dream. Now, Pharaoh has this dream with these seven robust cows coming out of the Nile, like the marshes in the Nile, and these seven emaciated cows coming out and then swallowing up the seven uh, fat, healthy cows, and then had a, a, a similar uh, repetition with ears of corn. So Pharaoh is going crazy of these dreams. He calls his magicians who can't interpret it, and that's when the cupbearer remembers, oh, there's this guy I met in prison a couple years ago. Let's not talk about me being in prison, but I met this guy in prison and he can help you. And uh, so now Joseph is brought to Pharaoh's court and Joseph hears the dreams and he says, what it means is you're gonna have seven great years uh, of abundance and then seven years of famine that can swallow up your seven years of abundance if you're not careful. Joseph lays out a plan to Pharaoh of what he would do to prevent it. Pharaoh is so impressed that he names Joseph as viceroy over Egypt, the number two guy in all of Egypt, like prime minister. Joseph is given a ring of authority and all who see him cry out, Avrech, Avrech. This is important to our story and come back to that. So now Joseph is gonna get married. Who does he marry? Osnot, who's Osnot? She's the daughter of Potiphar, the very minister who he was working for. So in other words, her mother was the one who accused Joseph of rape. He's now marrying the daughter, and they're going to have two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. Now, uh, Joseph begins preparing Egypt for the famine, and sure enough, the famine does begin. And Joseph then starts selling grain for all the wealth of Egypt. So if you're hungry, then uh, if you come to the court, Joseph can sell you some grain. So he first takes all the wealth, then he takes all the possessions, then he takes all the land, and he basically is able to strip the Egyptians of their wealth and gives it all to Pharaoh, except for the priesthood. It's another important detail we're going to come back to later. Now there's a fa the famine has reached Canaan as well. So Jacob, Joseph's father, is still in Canaan with all the brothers, and Jacob sends the brothers to, to the land of Canaan, to, sorry, to the land of Egypt to buy grain. And Joseph does a little test for them, which isn't important to our story, but let's just say they pass the test involving Joseph's brother, Benjamin. Uh, and the brothers are reunited and everyone hugs and they're happy. Uh, Pharaoh hears about Joseph's family and invites Joseph's family to immigrate. So all of Jacob's clan, that's including Joseph's family, that's 70 people. Now we're gonna settle in the land of Goshen, which is in Northeastern Egypt around the Nile. Um, about 20 years later or so, not quite, Jacob dies. Uh, he's embalmed. This is also going to be relevant for our story, but this, this 40 days and 70 days, and then Joseph dies later on. He's also uh, embalmed. Okay, so that's our story. I hope everyone feels caught up. For those of you who already know it really well, I uh, hope you don't mind the review. Now, what I want to do is set up the general atmosphere of Joseph, uh, and, and then we're going to move back to what's going on in Egypt. Okay, so uh, let, let's analyze the early part of the story. So this is going to be the story up till uh, Joseph crosses the border in Egypt. All right, let's look at what we know so far. He's from a Semitic family in Canaan. Well, those of you who are in the last lecture know very well this makes complete sense. That was the majority population in the land of Canaan at the time. There was uh, uh, the tribes would work together. The families would work together. They would farm the land together. Uh, this was not only true in ancient times, it's true today. I picked out a couple 
uh, modern peoples and what's what is now Israel and Lebanon, but the land of Canaan back then, uh, who you can appreciate still live like this, Semitic people in tribes. Uh, and the, uh, so you see the Druze and the Bedouin as my two examples. You can read through that while I'm talking. Now, uh, the Technicolor dream coat. let's talk about that. There's actually numbers of, uh, of, of wealth back then. Of course, they didn't have money, but you could compare how much someone would get for a day's work or a month's work and how much it would cost. So the garment, this valuable garment, just to give you an idea, a normal garment that someone wears would be at about a month or two wages for an average person. So imagine the shirt you're wearing right now to work a month or two just for that shirt. Forget your hat, house and your food and all that, just your shirt costs you a month or two wages. So this was an expensive item. Now, and, and by the way, the Torah um, writes a lot about, about, about how you're respecting a poor person's garment and this sort of thing, returning someone's garment if you're, if you're holding it for collateral. Uh, there was a lot of value. And then if you have this special garment, however you want to define what that special was, we'll say Technicolor, uh, it would be extra expensive. So well more than those one or two months wages. We know grain was very central to society, both in the land of Canaan and the land of Egypt. That's of course in this area of the world. In fact, in most of the world, that was the main source of calories for people. And then uh, the slavery aspect. So people did sell themselves into slavery. People did have did sell minors into slavery. They if, to, to pay off debt. Most likely, why are you going to sell yourself into slavery? Uh, it's it's to pay off debt. Uh, so people would actually sell. Unfortunately, would sell off their children uh, at times to, to to pay off debt. So this concept of some people off uh, makes sense with the time. Now the Semitic trade caravans. This is another throwback to our last lecture. We talked about after about 1900 BCE you had these Semitic peoples moving into Northeastern Egypt. So this also makes a lot of sense with the time. Uh, now, oh, and I, I wanted to just point out this, this Jethro of Midian, that's Yitro of Midian. Uh, interesting to note, uh, that's, this is Moses's father-in-law. And in Jewish tradition, he converted to Judaism, but actually in Druze tradition, he's their first prophet. So the founder of the faith that became the Druze was actually uh, Jethro of Midian. So uh, I think it's great you have this connection between the Druze and the, the ancient Midianites. It, by the way, if you don't know where Midian is, it is on this map uh, down here. Uh, so we're, that's Saudi Arabia today. Okay, I told you I was gonna go back to Egyptian history for a few minutes. So now we're gonna talk about a little bit of Egyptian history. So when, um, when, uh, Akhmos died, Amenhotep I became Pharaoh. Uh, Amenhotep was just a child, but he, his mother ruled until he became an adult. Uh, and then he is going to leave us with some very interesting uh, practices. Number one, he is the first king who would be buried in the Valley of the Kings. And that's now a very famous burial ground. That's where uh, most of the kings I'm gonna be mentioning in the next couple lectures all were found or at least their tombs were found. He was the first to do that. For archeologists, he left arguably the greatest gift uh, of uh, ancient uh, history, particularly those who specialize in daily lives. And that is, he started Deir al-Medina. So the two, the Valley of the Kings and Deir al-Medina are connected. Deir al-Medina was a hidden village that existed for 500 years, specifically for the people that built the tombs for the kings there was a problem, right? When you build these huge pyramids and these huge tombs where you're buried, everyone knows you're buried there. So all the tomb robbers, maybe it's the next day, maybe it's the next year, but eventually the tomb robbers are gonna be like, well, this is a giant pyramid. There's obviously gold in there. And they break in and they tear everything up and they steal all the wealth. So Amenhotep decides he's gonna fix that by being hidden away in this valley. But not only could the king, did the kings need to be hidden away in the valley, even the people who buried the kings need to be hidden away as well. So for 500 years, this city of Deir al-Medina existed, and it basically froze everyday life in time. So archaeologists can go through there and see what it was really like for someone, day-to-day -day worker, uh, and what they went through. And yeah, these people made a little bit better wages than the average people, but still it gives, it's like a, just a, um, 
little capsule, time capsule to show you what life was like back then. And this is just a great 3, 3D model. So you can see what the village looked like at this wall around it and these really tight uh, houses. Uh, now, Amenhotep did not have any children. Once again, he married a sister. So we're seeing the repetition, you marry your sister, you're gonna have problems having kids. Uh, they didn't seem to get it, or maybe they did. So I'm gonna talk about sterility of the Egyptian kings for a second. Uh, inbreeding causes sterility. Okay, so a couple generations of marrying your sister, it's not a surprise that these kings cannot have children. Uh, but they, even if they knew that perhaps that was related to the problem, they didn't stop. And, and there's reasons for that fairly good reasons. One is they believe they were gods. Uh, we don't believe they were gods, but they believe they were gods. So shouldn't a god only marry other gods? Uh, that would be one reason. Another would be political, right? Uh, if one family has all the power, then all the power stays in one family. So why get other families into it and start uh, risking to, to share the power? The, um, uh, the downside is you have deformed kids and then you have infertility. I did want to mention one other thing about ancient Egypt, uh, since we're talking a little bit about women's rights in this lecture. The ancient Egyptians are the only ancient civilization that I know of that blamed uh, men for infertility. Everyone else, all the Mesopotamians, everyone else I've ever studied, they always blame women when, the, when there's infertility, but Egyptians blame men, which was an interesting difference. When Amenhotep dies, he doesn't have children. He goes through, and we talked about this once before in a previous lecture. He actually names a general. Now, this gen, this had to be a successor. This general probably was some sort of noble family, you know, maybe a cousin, something like that. But this general, Thutmose, becomes the new pharaoh. And he is going to then marry Achmos, which is, I'm sorry, marry a daughter of Achmos, which was Amenhotep's father. Uh, so this is, so this is Akmos um, now, his, Akmos' daughter is now given uh, Thutmose some legitimacy because he, he's married a former pharaoh's daughter. He's going to lead some, ma some major uh, military invasions, both to the south, which is now modern Sudan, and then to the north to the, against the Mitanni, which uh, is in modern Syria. Now, the Mitanni, I'm gonna, they're going to come back to our story now. So they're just entering our story we're going to talk about it again in the next lecture, and they're also in the Exodus lecture as well. So the Mitanni people started, the, the, they probably were only a ruling class. That, that's a general thought. The Hurrians were probably the actually the ethnic people. And then these, these uh, horse warriors come into the area of Mitanni come riding into town and kind of take control. And then they lead, this, they, they lead this force and upgrade all the military technology and strategy and so forth. We have seen this before. Uh, those of you who know British history can appreciate the Norman invasion, right? The Normans probably were never more than 10% of the Anglo-Saxons, but they came in, they wiped out the Anglo-Saxon nobility, and then the new nobility were all Normans, even though they were a very small minority of the British. Uh, and the Brits we know today you know, still are from this, uh, a lot of them are still descendants of this, this Norman Anglo-Saxon uh, um, uh, collision in 1066. So uh, the Mitanni people, the, the going theory seems to be that they were a similar situation. Uh, for those of you who speak Hebrew can appreciate that the Egyptians called them Naharim. Uh, in other words, between the two rivers, you have a plural of rivers there. Uh, Thutmose is, not, is going to attack them by launching a major dual amphibious invasion. This is the first time we know of, of, of an international amphibious invasion. Achmos used an, a combined land and sea invasion to defeat the Hyksos, but that was on Egyptian territory. Thutmose is now going to widen the scale and use it to defeat the Mitanni and put them in, his, in their place, but he doesn't actually occupy the Mitanni. He only defeats them and then returns home, which is typical. Now, what I really want to do uh, is move on to, to Thutmose's daughter. Um, now, when Thutmose dies, he, his, his great wife, Achmose, has only given him one child, uh, and this is a daughter named Hatshepsut. Okay? So Hatshepsut, because she's a female, does not inherit the throne when her father dies. Instead, she has a stepbrother, 
uh, and he's go going to be, uh, or really I should say a half brother. Uh, so he, he's a son of a secondary wife. So he's going to get the throne and he's got to now marry his half sister. You can imagine the situation, but it seems to most Egyptologists that she probably was the power by, behind the throne already as soon as they got married. She had a very strong personality and she was 100% royal, uh, both her father being the pharaoh and her mother being the great, the great wife. Now, her husband dies after two or three years, uh, and this is when things get interesting. So you think of her as being older. Uh, she was probably 15 years old when her husband died, and now she's going to be the, the, this regent for an infant. We have a repeated situation here where Thutmose the first died, he had a young son, Thutmose the second, who was from a secondary wife. Thutmose second became Pharaoh briefly before Hatshepsut took it, and then now Thutmose the second died, and he's got a he's got a son from a secondary wife named Thutmose the third. Thutmose the second and uh, and Hatshepsut do have a one full child, and this is Neferu. Uh, she's not really going to take place part, take a part in our story. Um, you can ask me about her at the end. Okay. Um, Hatshepsut is going to rule for four years as a regent, but in 1475, she's going to name herself king. And this is very important. We're about to have a big time Jewish connection, but that's going to be the next slide. Um, so in 1475, she names herself uh, king. Uh, of course, that being slight issue because she's a woman. We're going to come back to that. Uh, she has some major projects that you can see on the slide. I, I don't necessarily want to go through it except just to point out uh, this is one of the obelisks that she built. You can see a couple standing obelisks right here. An obelisk was very big for the pharaohs because it represented rays of the sun. If you think on a really bright day, the way the rays of the sun come off towards the ground, it kind of has that look to it. So that's what the obelisks represent. Uh, so this was hers. When she died, she left this temple. So this is her mortuary temple. And I, I had closer pictures. I intentionally wanted this picture far away. So you can appreciate exactly how big this temple was. You can see it compared to the mountains. It was gigantic. So like I said, she became a widow when she was 15 years old. She never remarried. Uh, she only had that, the, the one daughter and she probably died around the age of 40. Okay, now I wanna get back to my little hint here on this etymology break. So we have a woman who just became king and we have a problem, right? What's the problem? Problem is she's a woman. Um, now, Etymology may provide a solution for us. The term Pharaoh was never used until the New Kingdom. It did not exist. All right, so let's look at the word Pharaoh. It actually, that's the Greek version of the word. The Egyptian is para. Para is, so para is usually house, and a is great. So Pharaoh just means the great house. So if you're a female king and want to hide that you're a female, why not use a title that's not gender specific, that talks about a family? So are Egypt, Egyptologists sure that it was during Hatshepsut when this term came in? No, but they are sure it was during the New Kingdom. Uh, and there are, uh, this, this is one of the pharaohs argued for being the one that starts it. This is also very important for us as Jews because in the Torah we read about Pharaoh and everyone's talking to the Pharaoh. So uh, that means that, the exodus had to have happened after you would refer to the king of the Egypt as Pharaoh. So it gives us a nice time when you know it's new kingdom before this term comes into common use. Okay, I want to show you something else about Hatcherson that's, that's kind of cool. This has nothing to do with Judaism, but I want to show it anyway. Okay, this is, these are sculptures of the same person throughout her reign. So when you look here, this was the picture on the last screen, you know, attractive younger female, very similar to the previous one. But and notice the chest too, not to be vulgar, just being scientific here. Uh, now look as you get to the middle here, right? Chest is receding a little bit. The face is filling out. And then look at the last two. That's a guy, right? That's a guy, but that's hatchets it. So clearly she was changing her appearance over time to be more palatable to the Egyptian people. It's amazing you could see that. Um, anyway, like I said, it didn't help our Jewish story. Now I wanna talk about uh, her successor. So uh, I gave you a lot of names before. I want to show you this little family tree. I think this will help. So King Achmos was the first one in, uh, who founded the New Kingdom. 
They had this, the, he had the son Amenhotep I, who died without children. Amenhotep I named his top general to be a successor. That was Thutmose I. When Thutmose I died, his daughter, you know, briefly he had Thutmose II here as a successor. We just talked about his daughter, Hatshepsut. Now, Hatshepsut and, and Thutmose II only had a daughter, but Thutmose II with another, a secondary wife, had a son. This is Thutmose III. So Thutmose III is Hatshepsut's stepson. And when Thutmose II died, he was literally an infant. He was very young. Um, so Hatshepsut is now going to rule. First, she had that four years of regency I talked about until she became king. And the two of them are going to share power for um, 22 years. Thutmose III is actually going to reign for 54 years when you count the 30 plus years he was ruling uh, along with the along with the regency with Hatches. It's a long time, but when you start when you're like a toddler, that helps. Uh, now, Thutmose the Third's reputation uh, is that he is the greatest military pharaoh. He's called the Egyptian Napoleon. Under him, he would expand the empire to, the, to its greatest size. Uh, and repeat, uh, like I said here, it's 17 foreign military campaigns in 32 years or so. And that's a long time. In fact, uh, Egyptologists feel that he probably spent most of his junior regency under Hatshepsut in the army. Like it kind of got rid of him, but at the same time, he probably wanted to be there. He was building up his base. The army was supporting him. He was getting experience and he would show up once he was the sole ruler. Now, uh, let's look a little bit more at this. As he expanded the empire, I just want you to see all the countries involved here. We have Nubia, which is Sudan sending gold. We have Babylonia, which is Iraq, sending lapis lazuli, which is even more interesting because lapis lazuli actually comes from Afghanistan. So had to go from Afghanistan to Iraq and then to Egypt. You have the Hittites, which is Turkey. You have uh, Assyria, which is, that's really the Mitanni we're, we're talking about. You've, you've got the, the uh, I mean, there was an Assyrian empire too. I should be a little bit, uh, I should just say in general, it's the area of Syria uh, today. We have Ionia, which is the Western coast of today's Turkey and also some of the islands between Turkey and Greece. And then we have Mycenae, which is uh, again, part of modern Greece. So most people don't appreciate in the ancient world exactly how much trading was, was really going on. Uh, most impressive to you should be, I mentioned that Afghanistan was sending stuff all the way to Babylonia, which is sending stuff all the way to Egypt. Okay, now I want to, I'm not about to go through all 17 of Thutmose's military campaigns. It's a good way to get all of y'all to hang up. Uh, but I just want to pick one and then we're going to move on. All right. So the one campaign I want to talk about is the Battle of Megiddo. And I picked Megiddo for a couple reasons. Uh, one is Thutmose the third considered it his greatest battle, which is a good enough reason, I suppose. Also because Megiddo is so well known to this day, uh, both for Jews because of King Josiah being killed there and for Christians because of the, the reference of Armageddon and Revelations. Now, the, uh, the combatants in this case were the Egyptians versus a Mitanni coalition. These two, the two main cities fighting them was, was the city of Megiddo and the city of Kadesh. All right, so Megiddo and Kadesh are teaming up with some Mitanni allies, and they're trying to control the entry point to this main trade route. The Via Maris was the main trade route between Egypt and Mesopotamia, a lot of wealth passed through there. So the power was to control this entry point to the valley. And they're about to fight it out uh, for who is going to have that control. So Thutmose III is going to invade here. Uh, this, by the way, this bottom picture is a model of uh, Megiddo. You can see it up on this, this mount. Uh, and that mount is important because the, the reason you have the English term Armageddon is because it's really Har Megiddo. So Mount Megiddo in English. Uh, and so that harg, that H always seems to get dropped uh, when it becomes English and it became Armageddon instead of Armageddon. Okay, now this map we're gonna refer to for the next 30 seconds or so. Uh, this gives you the general route, uh, but so you've got 10,000 experienced troops coming into the land of Canaan and they're trying to get to Megiddo. So here's the, the close up Megiddo. Now, Megiddo is, uh, has three main routes to get there. You've got a big road here in the north. You've got a big road here in the south. You have this tiny little narrow road in the middle. Uh, so Thutmose's generals tell them they should go north, they should go south. And Thutmose goes, no, nope, I want to take the middle route. 
And they're like, are you crazy? It's, we can only get two men shoulder to shoulder. We can easily be ambushed. And he goes, I want to go that way because no one's going to be expecting it. Uh, and wouldn't you know, he was exactly right. He got his picked troops all the way through the route. Uh, he did send up some, some cavalry to secure them from high above. But basically, because he went the route, everyone thought you'd be crazy to go. The defenders of Megiddo also didn't secure that route. The, the defenders secured the north route and the south route, thinking only a nut job would go through this middle narrow valley. And Thutmose got his troops through there. They grabbed a, they, they grabbed a quick, quick toehold, but it was already the end of the day when they got through. The next day we're going to talk about is the, is the real battle. Um, and here's a map to show you the real battle. So Thutmose III comes out dressed on Electrum. That's a, the, like, the, I mean, his armor. Uh, Electrum is a mix of silver and gold. So he's shiny. He's trying to look like a god. He leads his men from the middle. And they, have, they use this concave attack that he, that he designed. And as you can see, the concave attack started to turn the corners here. And the, tr the troops from Kadesh and Makedo realized they were losing, and they fled. Now, what the Egyptians should have done was chase them while they were fleeing, but they didn't. Instead, they stopped. Uh, the Egyptian troops stopped, and they started looting. And this is a very important detail. Uh, I'll come back right back to it. Um, the, using the, this time that the, the defenders had from the, their attackers looting, these, these enemies of the Egyptians would retreat behind their walls of Megiddo. And this would lead to a seven-month siege. One uh, little detail of the siege that's interesting is the most, he claims himself, could have been a military engineer, but uh, he, he invents this covering battering ram like a tank so he can cover all of his, the guys in the battering ram as they bring it forward. It's the earliest recording of, of that sort of technology. In the end, after seven months, the, the, the people of Megiddo would fall, uh, and this would secure Thutmose's greatest victory. While it would not be without problems, Egypt now would have a secure base in the land of Canaan for the next 400 years. So this is a very long-term victory, but to emphasize that he still had issues, he would go back to for, I'm sorry, he would go back and have 16 more invasions in the next 20 years, the poor guy. Uh, this is related to, uh, we talked about this, I think, in the second lecture, but um, the Egyptians were resurrectionists, uh, and they believed you could only be resurrected if you were buried in the Holy Land. The Holy Land was Egypt, so it was very hard to get native Egyptians to stay out of Egypt for very long because they did not want to die and not be in their homeland. And as we all know, uh, that uh, the afterlife was very important to the Egyptian religion. The one little detail I want to mention how we, how, how we feel like there's a lot of truth to the story is I've said Egyptians never like talking about mistakes. They never like talking about losing. But here it is, Thutmose is talking about how mad he got when all of his troops started looting and allowed his enemies to retreat. This one little line adds a lot of truth to the story. Uh, like, why, why would he possibly bring that up unless, unless it really happened? Okay, when Thutmose is gone, these are my last two pharaohs I'm covering tonight. Um, and as I said, and then we're going to move on to the next, the, the next of this lecture is going to be all on Jewish connections. But I had to at least mention these guys. I actually was about to skip them, but I was like, I got to at least mention them. All right, so uh, we have another Amenhotep and another Thutmose. Now, Amenhotep II was the son of Thutmose III. He's going to rule 26 years. And think about his, his dad was on the throne. Part of a regency was on his throne for 50-something years. Now, he's going to be on there for 26 years. That's set, you know, almost 80 combined years between the two, uh, father and son. That's a long time. What's great about him is over and over again, he talks about what a great athlete he is, that he was the fastest runner. He was the fastest rower. He could fire an arrow through three inches of copper from a chariot. Uh, maybe in the snow, riding upside down, I don't know. But no, he definitely said uh, shoot an arrow through three inches of copper on a, while riding on a cherry. He also claimed to be faster at rowing than 200 of his naval men. Um, so the general feeling is he probably was a pretty good athlete because he just talks about it over and over again. Um, he's related to our next lecture because he, it was during his era that the Otten was introduced. This is the Otten. It's a sun here. And it's hard to tell from here, but I wanted to show you like a real picture, not a drawing. Um, these are little hands extending, a bunch of little hands extending. So when we get to Akhenaten, Aten is going to be the star of the show. Uh, that's our next lecture.
The other, the other uh, Pharaoh I wanted to mention was Thutmose IV because there was very few Pharaohs that left us a gift to this day and Thutmose left all of us a gift to the day. Everyone in this entire world, he left us a gift. What did he do? When he became Pharaoh, the Sphinx was a thousand years old and in horrible shape. And he had a dream, which tells you he probably had a weak claim to the throne, but he had a dream that if he were to recondition the Sphinx, um, this, the Sphinx, a thousand years old and looking even worse, if he were to recondition it, uh, he would become Pharaoh. So he at his own expense reconditioned it and he became Pharaoh. Uh, and then he, uh, the, the Sphinx was buried in sand uh, when it was rediscovered a couple hundred years ago. Uh, but really the shape that it's in today, we can thank that most of four for. So we all can appreciate this gift that he left the world. Uh, he also had a peace treaty with Matani, the same people that we just talked about the, the, the fighting uh, with the two predecessors. Uh, and the tallest standing obelisk today is also the most the fourth, but notice where it is. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I said it right. I was all, uh, uh, the tallest standing obelisk is also the most the fourth, um, but it's in Rome because the Romans loved obelisks and would take them. Uh, so you can, if you want to see his, his uh, obelisks, don't go to Egypt, go to Italy. I promised you I was getting back to Jewish stuff. So I feel like at this point, I've loaded you up with enough Egyptian history. Let's get back to the Jewish stuff. Now, all this information you're going to see is going to, going to coalesce into our, our Joseph tale. Now, um, we're going to pick up the Joseph story where he's now just gotten to Egypt. This is a great map. You can look at this while I'm talking. The red here are the Midianites. So this is showing the path that the Midianites followed uh, in their trading routes so up through Midian up through the land of Canaan, through, you know, modern Israel, and then on to Egypt when they dropped off Joseph. So Joseph is now going to be a, uh, is now going to work for Potiphar, right? And he becomes a successful slave, but then he gets put into jail. Uh, he becomes this great dream interpreter, both for Pharaoh's ministers and the Pharaoh himself. Uh, and then he is named Viceroy over Egypt. He's given this ring of authority. He gets married to a nice Egyptian girl. Uh, and uh, then the famine begins. So we're going to break this next section down into five parts. Now, everyone knows I really like etymology. So, so let's, let's jump onto the etymology again. Uh, we can learn a lot just from this. I want to look at three names. Now, you can see all three of the names I'm talking about here in verse 45, which is highlighted for you. Uh, but let's look at the name Potiphar. Okay, so in the Torah, we read Potiphar, or later on Potiphar, either way, uh, there actually is an Egyptian name very similar, named Padi Ra. Uh, Padi means that given by, and Ra being a very famous god, right? Ramses is, from, is named from the same god. Uh, so Padi Ra means that given by Ra. It was that actual Egyptian name. Uh, great detail. Here's another one. What about this nice Egyptian girl that Joseph marries? Well, there are some different rabbinical interpretations of it, but it just so happens that her name also translates to an Egyptian name. Uh, her, so Asnat, which we say in Hebrew, can become Asanith. Uh, and, and by the way, remember, when you're talking about Egyptians, they had the TH sound that uh, Jews did not have. So Hebrew speakers did not have the TH sound. So Asnat is comparable to Asnith. Az is belonging to, and Neith is, a very, is another very well-known goddess in Egypt, so belonging to the goddess Neith. And then finally, something that has stumped rabbis for many, many years, uh, is this nickname that Pharaoh gives Joseph. And now remember, when Joseph is interpreting the dreams, he's saying that he's not interpreting the dreams, God is interpreting the dreams, that he's doing what Hashem, his, this, his living God, is telling him to do, so then when you look about 100 years ago, uh, an Egyptologist came up with this theory for what the name means. And it's, if anyone's going to accept it in modern scholarship, this is the accepted name. So the Sapernata Yuf Anach uh, is the God speaks and he lives. So when you listen to, the, the, to the, the story of Joseph and the dreams and the way he talks to the Pharaoh, this name works out perfectly. Uh, and by the way, even if you don't know anything about Egyptian, this Anak seems should be similar to you because that's that's life, right? You see the Ankh all the time. Uh, that's life for Egyptians. 
Okay. Uh, now I'm going to move on and talk about the magicians. That's going to be our next little piece. Okay, Pharaoh's magicians. So Pharaoh, we talk about the magicians a lot. They're most commonly associated with the with the Exodus, right? When Moses is coming and starting these, where you have the snake with Aaron throwing his staff down, and then you have the plagues and the Pharaoh's trying to mimic it. But we have a, a very similar line here in chapter 41 of Genesis. And I want to I want to go over how this compares to reality. All right. So when Pharaoh has these dreams and he's all upset, he calls on his uh, his magicians. His, here's his necromancers, but really uh, magicians, and asks them to translate it. And they come and they say they don't know what the dreams mean. So this this is a great detail. Okay. The reason this is a great detail is actually these magic books, these dream books, really exist. So this London Medical Papyrus, by the way, both these can be seen in the British Museum. Uh, the, this London Medical Papyrus talks about dream interpretation. Uh, by the way, so does the, the second one here. The second one obviously is much more complete, but it's much later. It's already into the early Christian era, uh, but it's just so complete. I want to show you a picture of that as well. But what we can gather from, the, from these magic books is magicians in ancient Egypt could not just guess, okay? They couldn't just be like, you know, like hucksters, like, oh, that sounds good. Uh, they actually had to have a legitimate explanation in their books for something. So they would look up a dream, and if there was nothing like it in the book, they just said, I don't know. And they look up a magic spell. If there was nothing like it in the book, they just said, I don't know. Uh, and we see this in the Torah, the same response. Um, so they were not allowed to guess. This, this last example, though, is my favorite example of what, like, one of the dreams that really is in the book. So if you're dreaming that you see a dwarf in a, in a if you're dreaming you see a dwarf in a dream, it means your life is half over. So this kind of gives you an idea of these dream interpretations and, and how they work. All right, so now I want to move on and talk about cows. Dreaming of cows. All right, what do cows tell us? So it's, it's very interesting that Pharaoh dreams about cows, that these seven cows represent the seven years of abundance. Why? Because the cow was the symbol of abundance in Egypt, specifically the cow. Uh, the cow represented the goddess Hathor, and Hathor was, was drawn as an animal or as a woman with bovine ears. So here she is with her bovine ears. Um, the... the um, this, this bovine imagery is very important all the way, as far as you go back in Egyptian history. Uh, if you look here, this is our Narmar palette. For those of you who didn't hear the second lecture, this palette right here is 5,000 years old. Uh, and look, you still have this bovine imagery on it. All right, so this is the, this is the abundance. Now, um, so you have these seven cows who come out of the marshy Nile and they represent abundance. What do we have here? We have a picture and a temple of a cow coming out of the marsh. Uh, that's it. Now, this temple is later. This is actually from built by Ramses the Great. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I love the imagery and that you actually see this cow coming out of the marsh, just like Pharaoh's dream. Uh, now, we're moving on to famine. So we have our, our well-nourished cows, and then we have our seven, uh, our seven famished cows. So let's talk about famine for a minute. In ancient Egypt, we have uh, repeated records of famine, and I actually just had to pick what I wanted to use. There's multiple options. Uh, the most famous specifically is the famine Stella. Now you can tell if it's called the famine Stella, it must really be talking about famine, right? Uh, so it's much older, much older. It's actually Old Kingdom, not even Middle Kingdom, it's Old Kingdom. Uh, but what is interesting about it is it talks about uh, Imhotep, so, uh, for those of you who missed the second lecture, uh, which again, you can see on YouTube now, we talk about the, the pyramids being built and how the two pyramids got built. So the first pyramid builder was, jo was Zozer, and Zozer had a polymath as his engineering expert by the name of Imhotep. And this, this, this actually goes back to our second lecture because it talks about Zozer sending Imhotep to, to investigate this famine. But the, the, the cell is talking about a seven-year famine, just like the Torah. So people lead it up that you actually have this record of, of Egyptians dealing with a seven-year famine. Although this isn't the, the famine we know, which is it's way too, way too early for it. Um, 
We also have the Ipparor papyrus, which was in the last lecture. That's the Abraham lecture. And we talked about uh, around the time Abraham was alive, the Egyptians complaining about, about, the, about plagues. Uh, and specifically, one of them is famine. And then the last detail, I, and by the way, I talk about it more in the last lecture, so that's why I'm, uh, I'm going fast tonight. The last one I wanted to talk about is temple lands. There's a very interesting detail about temple lands, one sentence that I really like, and that is if you look here at verse 26 under chapter 47, only the farmland of the priests alone did not become Pharaoh. So this goes back to the Joseph story, right? Everyone's bringing all their wealth and all their possessions and all their land to Pharaoh, but the Torah tells us that the priesthood did not have to give their land to Pharaoh for food. And this small detail adds a lot of validity because it was true. The one possession Pharaoh could never take was the priesthood's land. That was their land under Egyptian law. And it's great that the Torah references that. Then Joseph as vizier. Now, Joseph is going to be second only to Pharaoh. And this is odd, right? You have this foreigner, not even Egyptian, this foreigner who comes in, the Semite of all things, and he becomes the vizier to uh, the Egyptians, the prime minister to the Egyptians. And so what I want to point out is a few things. One is vizier was a real position throughout, starting with the old kingdom. So the very first vizier was the previously named Imhotep, that first polymath I talked about. Again, lecture two, if you want to know more about Imhotep, uh, not Jewish. But Imhotep uh, was the first of a long line of viziers. And what we saw as Egyptian history went on is that non-royals could be named vizier. So if you really were a very up and coming, smart, responsible, and clearly political, uh, you could be raised to high levels of Egyptian government, the highest level being vizier. And what we have seen now with the new kingdom is there's actually at least at least two recorded his recorded occasions of a Semite like Joseph becoming vizier, and I'm going to talk about those guys in our next lecture. So come back next time, and we'll talk about these two Semites who became vizier. Now I want to talk about the signet ring. So this, if you look here at the with Joseph, when Joseph right, actually I forgot to highlight it here, but if you look in line on verse 42. It says, Pharaoh removed his ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's hand. Okay, so this is the signet ring. These signet rings most definitely existed. They most definitely were used for stamping uh, as a symbol of authority. Here's a couple. This is Amenhotep II. He was the one I told you was the great athlete who could shoot the arrow through three inches of copper. That's the signet ring for his government. Uh, and then we have Ramses here. This is actually Ramses VI. This is not the Ramses of our of our Exodus lecture, uh, but nonetheless, it does have the, he does share the same name with them. So I want to show you that signet ring as well, so you can see Ramses here in in hieroglyphics. So we know the signet rings actually exist. So we know it was a real practice of authority. Um, now the last detail I want to mention is we're going to get back to my etymology. Uh, I want to talk about this line Avrech. Now, if you look at Avrech, uh, you will see a lot of commentary about how it's how the Av is connected to Father. And the Rech is maybe connected with Rex from, the, from Roman, which means God. None of this makes any sense to me. It can't be Hebrew because the people of Egypt aren't going to walk around seeing some vizier and yelling a Hebrew term to them, or even less likely a Latin term to them, right? So Avrech must mean something in Egyptian. So let's look at that. Avrech can be broken down to three Egyptian words. Uh, and uh, when you're going, this is like the TH and the T, uh, the the Av and the Av, that B and V are interchangeable. Uh, so Av means heart in ancient Egyptian. Then you have Re, Tu, and then you have Ech, You. So Avarech actually translates to heart to you, which was an Egyptian line similar to what someone would say today in that part of the world, like God be with you, heart to you. Um, so, by etymology, we have another great detail uh, to the whole Joseph story. Now, we're going to get to the, a um, uh, little bit to the, the later part of his life. 
Okay, so getting back to the story, just to remind you, so we now have a we now have a, a famine in the land of Canaan. So Joseph sends his son. So, sorry. So Jacob sends his sons to buy grain. Uh, Joseph recognizes his brothers. He recognizes Jacob's sons. They're all united in Egypt. The uh, the Jacob clan, uh, the Jews would settle now in Goshen. The tribe is about fifty. Is about seventy people. Um, and and about fifteen years or so uh, later, uh, Jacob dies. Now, when Jacob dies, there's a great detail here, and that is um, about the 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 forty days and seventy days. We're going to get to that in one second. And then Joseph dies later after that, saying he wants he's going to be embalmed in Egypt, but he wants to be buried with all the Jews. By the way, I should mention Jacob and Joseph are the only two Jews recorded as being embalmed. Uh, just that doesn't really connect to our story, but I just thought it was kind of, it's interesting. Now, um, let's go back to our story. First of all, Goshen. Here's Goshen. It's in northeastern Egypt. If you're coming from Canaan, where is the first part of Egypt you're going to land? That's going to be Goshen. And it just so happens Goshen was the right land for shepherds, uh, for those who kept animals, which was repugnant to Egyptians, but that was a typical job for the Canaanites. And so they settle in the land of Goshen. Great detail, makes sense, fine. All right, let's now um, uh, take a real example. This is the Anastasi papyrus. This was during the reign of Merneptah. Uh, for those of you who've seen the Exodus lecture, this is the same guy who left us the Merneptah Stella. Uh, so this is jumping forward a few years, but I want you to see it because the connection is great. All right, we have the, this tribe from Edom, and you can see Edom right here. Okay, there's Edom. Uh, so we have this Semitic tribe from Edom. They have famine in their land. They're starving. So they ask the Egyptian authorities to let them settle in Goshen to ride out this famine. So you have an actual tribe, an actual Semitic tribe, not quite from Canaan, but really, really close. Edom versus Canaan here. Um, and they are allowed by the Egyptian authorities to come in and ride out the, the famine in Egypt. And it specifically says in the papyrus, it's to keep the, the people and their animals alive. Uh, another, another good detail. Okay, now let's, uh, let's go on to the kind of my, um, my grand finale of our connections tonight. And I want to talk about this 40 days and 70 days, number 23 here. Okay, so if you read any authority on the process of uh, mummifying someone in ancient Egypt, you've got two deadlines. You have 40 days. So first of all, someone dies, they're covered with salt for 40 days. And then after 40 days, they're going to be, uh, they have this ceremony. And then after 70 days, they're wrapped in, they have another ceremony and they're wrapped in bandages. This is not controversial. This is not questionable. This is like just standard, standard. You can look it up. The 40 days and 70 days are the two key deadlines to mummification. And it's great when you look here in chapter 50, and it's talking about what happened after Jacob died, and the 40 days were completed for him. The embalming was completed, just like the instructions still read today. And then the Egyptians mourned for him for 70 days, and then he's, gone, he's taken back to the land of Canaan to be buried. This detail is phenomenal because this, we all know now today because of Egyptologists, this would not be a commonly known thing in the ancient world unless you're in Egypt. Uh, and to, to have this level of detail that matches perfectly with the, the same ceremony for mummification is, is another uh, great connection and perhaps my favorite connection of this, this entire lecture. All right, so next time we're gonna talk about uh, Perhaps the greatest pharaoh ever, uh, even though he's a man of peace. We're going to talk about the heretic pharaoh who was, wouldn't you know it, a monotheist. And we're going to talk about the most famous pharaoh today, the one everyone knows better than anyone else. That's King Tut. So we're going to talk about King Tut's story. But I'm not forgetting that this is, this is world history by a Jew. Uh, we're going to be talking about the Hebrew people, where the term Hebrew comes from, where Hebrew people are recorded in ancient Egypt and in Mesopotamia. And then we're going to meet, as promised, a couple real-life Josephs, a couple Semitic viziers that actually held power in the Egyptian court. 
So I have another session here where the archaeology and the, the Torah intersect. Uh, so just to summarize, we talked about the world of Joseph during the time of Egypt. Then we talked about the founding of the, the new kingdom. Uh, we went over Joseph's story. Then we had the new kingdom's first kings. Then Hatchet said it was probably my favorite one thus far, uh, the, the female pharaoh. Then we have Thutmose the third, the Egyptian Napoleon. We talked about Joseph's early years and how they match up with archaeology. Then we talked about him as vizier and those years, how they match archaeology. And then we concluded with Joseph's death and really Jacob's death, even more specific, and how that matches with uh, archaeology. Okay, if you want to know more, here's my email address. We, I just started a YouTube channel, um, so I'm figuring out how to use it, but I've been getting a lot of views on that YouTube channel. So uh, stay tuned. We'll figure out some way to use it uh, for the, all of us. Now, um, that being said, I can open the floor to questions if anyone has any questions.